Okay, let's get uh, let's get started. Good morning, everybody, and um, welcome. Uh, my name is Ian Mulhern. I'm the executive director of UK Policy at the Table Institute for Global Change, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this our third COVID uh, webinar from the UK Policy team. Um, we're talking this morning about business and the recovery from the COVID crisis. Uh, and we're doing so at a moment when the government is on the cusp of announcing further restriction, uh, further lifting and easing of the restrictions on different businesses uh, uh, that will happen over the, the next days and weeks. And I'm sure that historians looking back on this webinar will um, probably be able to tell that hairdressers have not yet uh, reopened. Uh, and some of us uh, at least uh, uh, could do with uh, visiting one. Uh, but as the uh, government uh, starts to unlock uh, the economy, it's also thinking about how it removes, starts to remove many of the support systems that it put in place uh, to uh, put the economy into a deep freeze back at the time of the lockdown at the end of March. Um, at that time, there was obviously huge uh, hope that what we'd be seeing would be a rapid uh, bounce back. Uh, to, uh, to an economy that looked very much like it, it did before the crisis. But I think it's becoming increasingly clear that a lot of the optimism around that has now um, fade, has faded and there are uh, a number of uh, concerns. First of all, it looks like we'll be looking at a much slower return to normality than perhaps we might have hoped back then. Uh, secondly, social distancing measures look like they were going to be almost semi-permanently in place. Uh, which creates uh, lots of problems for sectors that rely on high volumes and, and, and have low margins. Uh, and uh, thirdly, we have potentially customers changing tastes, uh, which will mean that uh, all of these things will mean that large parts of the economy may not be viable in the, the way that they were uh, before the crisis. Um, so in terms of thinking about government support coming out of this crisis, the government has a real challenge on its hands to try and sort, the, if you like, the sheep from the goats which businesses and enterprises are going to continue to be viable and which are not. And it needs to make uh, the, its calls on this very carefully because if it goes too aggressively with removing support, we could be looking at very high rates of unemployment and uh, a huge uh, uh, um, permanent uh, scarring effects on the economy. Uh, but if it goes too slowly, it could be looking at racking up vast debts and uh, uh, supporting lots of companies that will never really pay, uh, be able to pay their way or be viable, and in so doing, slowing the recovery to, to normality. Uh, so what should, in that context, the government's response look like? What is the perspective from businesses in different parts of the economy? These are some of the questions that I'm joined this morning by a fantastic panel uh, to discuss. We have uh, four panellists this morning. We have uh, Darren Jones, MP, the newly elected chair of the Bayes uh, Select Committee. Uh, we have Baroness Lucy Neville-Rolfe, who is a uh, former Bayes and Treasury Minister, as well as a former Executive Director at Tesco. Um, we have Jürgen Meyer, former Chief Executive at Siemens UK and a member of the Industrial Strategy Council. And we have Giles Wilkes, former advisor to Theresa May and Vince Cable on uh, economic policy matters. So we have a wealth of political policy and business experience uh, to draw on, and I think it'll be a really rich discussion. Uh, so we'll start off with five minutes from each of our panellists. Um, and at that point, um, we will, after that point, we will open it up to wider questions from participants. Um, okay, without further ado, let's get going. Um, Giles, I'll hand over to you, if I may, to kick us off. Thank you very much, Ian. And you, you posed some really difficult challenges there. This is not an easy time to be writing policy advice to the Prime Minister. So one of my first cowardly recourses is to try to challenge one of the questions, which is, you say, it's important that the government should choose which companies should survive and which don't. It's not just a political special advisor's view that governments hate choosing. And even when it's a really stark situation, such as the fallover of a steel company in a particular difficult part of the country, they hate being in the position of being told, it's up to you whether or not these jobs should go. And so when you then extend that over the entire country and ask the chancellor to say, now make your decision, which company should stand, which ones should not, do not be surprised if they try to look for every other recourse first. And the natural recourse is the market. It's very, um, a couple of months ago, it seemed totally vain to prate on about what the market thinks about all of this stuff, because the market seemed to have stopped functioning. The stock markets were collapsing 20%, the government debt markets weren't working properly. You couldn't be sure that the 
the financial markets could discern a, a good prospect from a bad prospect. Right now, I'm convinced the Treasury doesn't think that is the case anymore. The normal incentives by which we decide which companies are insolvent or not, or which jobs stay or not, are kind of there. And so you still have to revert to the usual way of approaching the Treasury, which is to explain why there might be something that the market doesn't understand and therefore needs the government's special intervention to do. So is this a strategic sector? Is it one that has got important infrastructural needs? Is it something that falls over? and everything else falls over with it. Now, a couple of months ago, these incredibly generous and unconditional support schemes that the government designed were not like that. They were effectively based on a very important principle, which is, um, I suppose you could call it like shielding. In other words, if we allow the market forces for what they are right now to operate, we'll just wipe out lots of valuable capital, we'll wipe out all sorts of important job relationships with firms, it doesn't matter if you're a good company or a bad company. And when we finally come to the phase of this crisis where we're able to talk in normal economic terms of getting the economy moving again, there won't be anything there to get going again. Now that was the assumption behind these really big, generous, and I would say mostly correct schemes that the government got going a few months ago. But that's not going to be the case during the restructuring phase. During the restructuring phase, as your introduction made clear, we have a really difficult job of working out what the new economy is going to look like. New patterns of economic demand, new sort of preferences, and new sector by sector health concerns. Now, you, the idea that the government in central Whitehall is going to somehow work out that cinemas need to operate like this, pubs need to operate like that, and therefore all the support schemes need to work in a way that cleverly matches that. I think that's a, there's almost like a fallacy of the all-seeing government there. What it hopes is that it can make sure that the private sector can support it, make sure that general demand conditions are good enough, and then it's going to leave it to the sort of ugliness of the market to do it correctly. One of my... Um, constant beefs as a special advisor in the industrial strategy brief and it was a wonderful privilege to be in it because before 2010 and Vince Cable nobody believed it was a word you could use you just leave it all but people used to say look okay so you're doing industrial strategy what are you going to boost what are you going to fall and mostly you are still leaving it up to private individuals and, um, and market forces and fund managers and so forth. We didn't sit around saying, we like this industry, we don't like that industry. At the very most, we would be setting up structures like an aerospace technological institute or something to invest in the future of autos or something. There was always more laissez-faire than people actually expected. So my, my, my big message would be, I would still expect the government largely to leave this to market forces even if some of the sectors will have a particularly strong case to make. I believe Rishi Sunak said it only yesterday to a Lord's Committee that they thought about a sectoral approach to the job retention scheme and they just thought it's going to be much too difficult because there's so many knock-ons. You help one business, but then it's one further up the supply chain that hurts it and so forth. So never underestimate how complicated it is also to try to do things sectorally. The other final point I would make is that um, the government came into this crisis with a lot of really serious agendas, levelling up, research and development boosting, and new ones that it's going to need to, to develop from coronavirus, such as reshoring supply chains and so forth. All of these, at the time, a few months ago, before we realised we had COVID to deal with, they thought they could solve largely through political will and fiscal open-handedness. They didn't really have a strong plan for how to level up the economy or how to make really good use of this R&D. They just had incredible bombastic political self-confidence because of what they felt they'd achieved the previous autumn. They don't come in here with a solid blueprint like I think New Labour did in 97, or you could say that Margaret Thatcher did in 1979 similar really pivotal turning points in the in the state's history but in those cases they had a really strong intellectual base for what they wanted to do in this case they just had this kind of bombastic self-confidence so they're going to have to learn on the job and that's what i'm i'm really struggling to work out how those previous agendas are going to survive because if you thought they were difficult before they're way more difficult now. They've got much less fiscal resources and they've got several other difficult problems to deal with like recapitalizing Great Britain and dealing with the devastating, devastated high street. So I'd be very surprised if in a couple of years time, we're very much looking towards the party's manifesto. It's gonna be survival and growth at all counts in my view. Terrific, thank you.
Giles, thanks very much. That's a fantastic to, uh, way to kick us off. I just wanted to, just to clarify what you're saying there. I mean, in a sense, you're saying, look, it's too difficult to tailor anything really here. So we have to not go for phased uh, or sectorally phased withdrawals of support. Um, I, 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 and you're sort of saying, look, you've got to let the market do its, do its thing. But we are going to be in this world of sort of uh, it, it just a huge number of unknowns for some time to come, it seems to me. And the kind of approach you're taking is surely likely to result in very high levels of unemployment and quite a lot of hysteresis in an environment where there's just unknowable levels of uncertainty for some months to come. I mean, given that, is that, is that a, really an environment where we can expect the market to reach an optimal outcome? I don't mean macro indifference. I mean, I think the ideal model for the Treasury would be aggregate demand and spending is going really, really high, but they don't look at individual sectors and say, preserve this sector, keep it at this or that level. For example, I mean, restaurants. We know that the level of restaurant provision in this country is going to fall below 100%. Um, it isn't going to go down to 50% or 70%. That decision, they think, should lead to the market. But the general levels of spending and the trust that where if the jobs aren't in one sector, they're going to move to another sector. It's that intersectoral move that they think it's really hard to interfere with. And you might distort it if you do it wrong. Now, maybe that's too optimistic, but I would say in the defence, this is what happened after the 2010, um, in the 2010 to 2015 recovery. We had a retail recession then and lots of jobs going, in, but overall employment rose because we kept the whole labour market flexible. Now, you could say that that, that that model's run out of road. These weren't the jobs people wanted. They're very insecure, inflexible jobs. We might see a shift away from that. But in the meantime, the actual level of churn in the economy is where they're hoping these decisions are going to be made, not from some grand treasury plan. Okay, great. Uh, let's uh, move then on from the policy perspective to Jürgen for a more of a uh, on the ground business perspective. Jürgen, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Ian, and uh, <clears throat> and great to be uh, to be with you all. Thanks for for inviting me. I think there's probably two different angles here, or two different um, approaches. The one is the what do we do. <clears throat> excuse me, in the in the very short term, as we now exit um, lockdown, as we get businesses working again safely, and, and what's the approach there? What sort of short-term stimulus do you give into uh, uh, the economy? And obviously with that, we're looking for things like a gradual tapering off of the furlough scheme, which has already been announced, which I think is the right thing to do cross-sectorially. Um, and then there are other sort of short, shorter term stimulus measures, um, like, for example, what France have just done with their uh, uh, very significant eight billion um, stimulus package to uh, to create demand in the automotive uh, market for um, for electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. And obviously, that's with a view to the consumer um, buying those vehicles and then pushing a demand um, into uh, into the sector. So so that's some of the sort of short term type of activity. Um, I am giving a little bit more thought into what does it mean beyond that? What does it mean for the longer term? Which is really, I think, also more of what Giles was talking about. And that's what's the shape of the industrial strategy. And by the way, as Giles knows, because I worked with Giles on industrial strategy when he was in number 10 and I was the head of Siemens, um, you know, I've been talking about this for 30 years. Um, and I think it's something that we've been lacking. Uh, in the UK, or we've certainly been lacking a very strategic approach for. Um, now, what I think we need to do coming out of this is we do need to uh, pick some sectors um, which we believe are going to be real prosperity generators for the future. Um, and, and my gut feeling is, is for about sort of 30% of the economy, which, which I would call the frontier industries of the economy, which is high value manufacturing, um, which is anything to do with uh, uh, green growth, which is uh, anything to do with health innovation, which also includes fintech uh, and technology industries. I think you need to try and push that part of the economy up to about 30% of GDP. Um, my rough calculation is, is that at the moment, all of that is about 20%. 
about 10% of it is manufacturing and the rest is the other areas I described. And so you have to have a very strategic approach to how you're going to get that um, up to, uh, to, that, uh, to that 30%. Where I agree with Giles is for the rest of the economy, you can pretty much leave it to free market because once you've created a higher level of prosperity, you've created more demand for those frontier industries, you, know, you tend to find that the foundation industries or the supply chains into those industries and of course service industries around uh, look after themselves. So, so I would be calling for a, a very strategic, focused, long-term, I mean, I, I'm tending to call it a prosperity strategy as opposed to uh, uh, an industrial uh, strategy. Um, the, the sorts of areas that, that I would be uh, considering to pick, I mean, some we've already picked and been very successful at. Offshore wind was a perfect example um, where Siemens working together with government and the broader industry um, created both the demand for offshore wind which required a lot of government policy and government intervention. And then we created a lot of local supply chains, which created and are still creating prosperity. Other areas, electric car, hybrid vehicles. Um, I think we should focus more on that. I actually think it's an example where we might have missed the boat a little bit. I don't think we've been ambitious enough. We've not invested enough in R&D, battery technology, like some other countries have, Germany, of course, USA, uh, China. Um, other areas would be uh, um, electric aircraft and hybrid aircraft. I think that's an area where the UK can um, lead uh, the globe. So these are the sorts of areas where I would be looking to focus, channel huge amounts of R&D and innovation, and then, of course, let the companies prosper. I'm not looking for any more um, intervention other than choosing a focus, supporting with R&D, innovation and of course uh, skills too. And then the final area that I would focus on is to pick um, two or three horizontal themes. One of those horizontal themes I've been championing for, for, for many years, we now call it Made Smarter and I still chair that initiative. And that is all about how do we help we're focused on manufacturing businesses, but you can broaden it out. How do you help businesses adopt advanced digital technologies into their, uh, into their operations? Um, how do they adopt robotics, additive manufacturing, virtual reality technologies, and giving a bit of a leg up by way of grants, by way of technical advisory services to faster enable the industry to adopt these uh, technologies, which then means they can establish themselves faster in these frontier sectors. They can raise their productivity and uh, they can uh, become uh, stronger exporters and help boost our economy. And then the final area is of course the skills to be able to enable all of that to happen. And we have to have a much stronger focus on, uh, on particularly on the reskilling and the upskilling of existing workforces. And this is really gonna be a huge task because we're gonna have people coming out of sectors where unfortunately demand has dropped off, where there will be unemployment rising and how do we enable them to reskill to come into some of these uh, frontier sectors that I'm talking about that will create uh, some, uh, some, some very good high paid, um, high skilled jobs um, for, for those people. So I'll just leave it there for now. Thanks, Jürgen. That's great. And you, you kind of you mentioned, obviously, trying to support this kind of frontier third of the economy, as you put it. Um, but what you mentioned, some of the things that that support might look like R and D support and that kind of thing, which perhaps is, you see as a more long term uh, 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 view. But do do you also see the withdrawal of current support measures as being done differentially by sector with a, with you know more loans, more grants? Uh, a longer furlough scheme in those core, core frontier sectors as well. Well, I think the furlough scheme, which is the re, you know, which is the really the here and now. I, I totally agree with Giles on that. You know, I don't think you can you can differentiate that by sector. That was an emergency measure. I think it was really well put in. You know, I think that was good, and I think you're going to cross sectorially going to have to help sectors. Uh, to, uh, uh, to with that, with a flexible furlough scheme to come out of it. When you then go into the, 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 the stimulating the future economy, I do think things like, 
you know, which sectors do you give more grants to, loans to, um, where do you give R&D tax credits, where do you uh, uh, apply enhanced capital allowances for certain types of green technology, for example, I think you do need to differentiate because, you know, it would be absolutely crazy to now throw billions at the economy, which is what we are going to do. So, you know, forget free markets. Free markets are gone. We are going to be throwing billions at the economy and to help it uh, and to help it reestablish itself. And it would be crazy if you didn't target that in a way that defined the economy of the future that you wanted to have, which is greener, which is more productive and which is more high tech and which creates more well-paid jobs, particularly in regions outside of the southeast. Okay, great. Thanks, Jürgen. Now, um, just to remind people, if you've got questions as we go, please do drop them in the Q&A box uh, so we can start to uh, get a sense of what people are thinking. Um, I'll hand over now to uh, Baroness Neverolf to take us from there. Ian, thank you. And I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about prospects for different sectors under coronavirus, including, including retail. And I suppose I'd start by saying that retail and the food supply chain have had a good war. They cope with panic buying, which I think was always needless, but fear of hunger and disease are great motivators. They've kept the nation fed and pioneered social distancing in shops with fewer of the issues we've seen in the health system, a tribute, frankly, to private sector efficiency. And of course, there's been a shift to online with online shopping up 80%, um, sort of Amazon and Cardo being big winners. And we've seen an improvement in efficiency in the food sector um, and, of course, and of course, increased sales uh, in large and local shops with, with cafes and so on closed. So take my nearby village of Tisbury in Wiltshire. It's vibrant. There are well-ordered queues for the fishmonger, the deli, the butcher, the co-op. And then in the wider economy, you know, pharmaceuticals and household staples um, are doing very well. Um, as disease brings new opportunities and indeed um, AstraZeneca and, and Unilever are at top of the FTSE I think at the moment. And then online success which I think is very important for the future is not confined to food. So if you look forward to the new normal I think Covid will reward the digital economy permanently. Um, so the trends have been accelerated, I mean obviously there's video conferencing, um, there's gaming, you see consultants helping businesses with cloud solutions and AI, online education and medical care, I think will also flourish. Now, industries that could lose out in future uh, are there too. So there's those providing commercial property as business people discover efficiencies from working at home. I mean, I spend three hours less getting to work by train, said a banker to me yesterday, and the company is getting the benefit as I work those extra three hours at home. And of course, other sectors at risk are travel, especially the airlines, the cruise companies, and those that rely on proximity. So especially in the short term, the pubs, the restaurants, as we've heard, hairdressers, and of course, entertainment and sport. And then in energy, we've seen prices at long time lows, um, and this is even affecting returns in, in, into renewables. And then most banks are in the doldrums, with further grief expected if we move to negative interest rates. Uh, you know, financial institutions, as we all know well, need to be able to borrow short and lend long or they can't make money. Now, clearly managing the virus well, as we've seen elsewhere, can make a huge difference. And I think we suffer from a, a sort of mixture of bad luck and bad judgment. I, I've been particularly critical on testing, the failure to test, test, test from February onwards, on social distancing, by two meters rather than one meter as recommended by the WHO which and that obviously makes profitable re return to trade more difficult and now the introduction of quarantine rather than testing at airports I mean frankly dubious in a country where over 80 percent of GDP comes from services so what do I think that HMG should do by way of support well like previous speakers I believe in incentives and I also believe in limiting intervention as far as we can. And I think resisting the temptation to put up taxes because that could further dampen the economy. So, I mean, I commend the Chancellor for the injection of liquidity that we saw with uh, the VAT deferral and the uh, business rates holiday. 
Uh, but the furlough scheme, as everyone has said, is critical. And I think I would argue that it was actually too generous from day one. So that is it, it's keeping people at home and I think discouraging some businesses from reopening. And that, so the 60% contribution plan from August with the employer paying 25% share and a part-time option is much more like it, but it does need to decelerate rapidly. I think the scheme for the self-employed uh, should, should also be run down probably faster and so should the loan schemes. Um, now, I'm slightly more relaxed about grants, so those made to SMEs by the local authorities and the tech sector, which is support through UK, uh, Innovate UK to replace venture capital funds. I mean, these are more in the nature of helicopter money. So they encourage the rapid transition that we need to a new industrial structure. And I think support our enviously dynamic SMEs rather than sparing the wrong companies and leaving them with a legacy of debt. So I don't really favor trying to help winners by being selective. I think we'll get it wrong. Um, so I'm not really with Jürgen, although I do agree completely on R&D skills. Finally, except for strategically essential industries, I think we should vo avoid bailing out large companies if we can. I mean, Rolls-Royce was bailed out in the 70s and RBS and Lloyds during the financial crisis, but they took years to recover. Uh, HM Treasury still owns a huge chunk of RBS because too high a price was paid by the taxpayer. And success came from the new industries. You know, that was computer chips and indeed, you know, fintech and indeed actually retail, which was turned out to be a big employer through all those years. I mean, I appreciate the agony of disruption for businesses and individuals affected in the short run. But, you know, Sch Schumpeter has a lot going for him. If the economy is to recover its vibrancy and give our children a prosperous future, adjustment has got to start and it's got to be encouraged. Lucy, thank you very much. That's great. Um, I just wondered if you could comment a bit on um, uh, the obviously it's quite differential impacts across different parts of retail. We have um, the supermarkets have done really well. There's been a shift online. There's potentially quite a lot of concentration going to happen in that in that sector. But I guess other areas of retail perhaps are, have a very much bleaker outlook. And in the context of the government sort of talking a lot about levelling up, um, that, those implications for retail seem quite serious. Uh, you know, in terms of the high street locally and, and and that kind of thing. I mean, what how how serious do you think this is for you know, the high street and broader retail? Um, are we going to get are we going to get back to something that is at least something like what we had before, or is this really uh, are we looking at fundamentally unviable businesses up and down the high street, do you think? I mean, as I said, the, the big dynamic is online. Mm. That was coming anyway and was beginning to push small shops out of business in any event. And you were getting a change on the high street often, you know, from the mixed store selling household goods, you know, to more coffee shops and um, cook and all these various different kind of, of shops. So what's happening is that's going to be accelerated. We've got a big short-term pop, pop problem because of social distancing. I mean, so, supermarkets are quite large and they've managed the social dis distancing. It's been through the summer and everyone's queued outside. But um, it's going to be a lot harder in, in, in closed shops. And then, uh, you know, things like hairdressers, where you're going to only be able to do half the number of cuts. These are small businesses you know, teetering on the edge and there won't be so many because not so many will keep going. So I think that along the short, it's going to be difficult on the high street. And therefore the kind of community measures that I was talking about, you know, the grants from local authorities, you know, trying to help within towns, uh, possibly as part of the levelling up agenda will be important. And then I think we need to keep the rates low because that's been one thing that has been done this year, which is to make the rates lower and they've been a long term problem for the high street. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Okay, Darren, let's um, come finally to you. Now, your committee has been looking at a lot of these questions or will be doing so, so we're really keen to hear what you have to say. Well, thanks, Ian. And uh, what, I, what I'll try not to do is, is repeat or comment on previous contributions, which have all been um, extremely interesting for me to listen to, and I'm sure for uh, those tuning in today. I mean, as you mentioned in my committee, the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Committee, um, uh, from a parliamentary perspective, sits in the middle 
uh, you know, we have a job in holding the government to account, understanding the decisions the government takes and whether those have been effective and maybe offering up suggestions for how things could be done differently based on evidence and cross party consensus. But then on the other side, we're also the parliamentary channel for all of those, you know, vested stakeholders, whether they are SMEs or big corporates and multinationals, whether they're trade unions, um, uh, whether they're consumer groups or whether they're people with an interest in the delivery of industrial strategy, whether that's a question of devolution or finance or whatever it might be. And our job is to try to kind of mix all of that up, take the evidence, understand what works and what doesn't work, and to try to make some recommendations um, and, and, um, and statements about how we can go forward. Uh, our initial inquiry on the impact of COVID on business um, and consumers is ongoing. We've already started to take evidence of that. And of course, you know, in the future, as you would expect, we're going to be looking at this recovery question. For, from my perspective, um, uh, there, there's, there's kind of three buckets of um, uh, thinking that I'm, uh, that I'm trying to understand. The first is, as Jürgen talked about, how do you kind of slowly turn off the tap from the national emergency funding and transition without falling too quickly and, and causing too much harm, uh, both on individuals, economic capacity, export capacity, and then start to recover. And of course, there's going to have to be some fiscal stimulus in order to uh, recover. And we're just starting to think about that with the tapering of furlough, there's a question around Project Birch and sectoral bailouts and all that type of stuff. The bigger question though, and this is what this panel is about, is about the future and the restructuring of the economy and what role government should or shouldn't play in partnership with business. And I think the key word there is is partnership. I'm not someone that's advocating for kind of nationalization or um, a kind of state leadership of industry, but there is inevitably going to be some form of collaboration as we readjust our relationship and the role that the state uh, plays. And one of the interesting questions actually is, what capacity does the state have as a shareholder? Um, we have some examples of that, for example, in the post office, where uh, my committee previously has done some work on the particular issue around um, horizon in the post office but there was a broader question about the capacity and competence of government as a shareholder and the way in which government plays that relationship that's going to become a much more important conversation um, for us to uh, understand but then also when we think about fiscal spending and of course we've just had to you know borrow 300 billion quid in order to deal with the pandemic so how much we borrow and how we use that is a really important question for the future from my perspective you need to think about you know the infrastructure but also about people um, so of course we're going to want to invest in shovel ready projects to try to grow the economy uh, but we're also going to want to invest in people in order to maintain their productivity and capacity in the workplace whether that's about continued support for being in work and contributing not just in the private sector but in perhaps the public sector and the third sector too and how you invest in reskilling and skills education both for those younger people who we know are going to be disproportionately hurt as a consequence of the recession as it tends to be normal but also for those workers who are having to transition from older industries to new industries and a particular group where that's difficult is the kind of post 50 um, typically man manufacturing industry you know in my constituency maybe um, experienced in building airplane wings or landing gears who maybe don't have that work in the future you know how do you help them continue to be economically productive until they reach pension age that's a really difficult uh, public policy challenge for us and linked to that is the question of devolution and i don't think that we have the devolution model right in our country um i've said this before and it's no particular criticism at any level of devolution but in my neck of the woods in bristol where we have the city council and councillors we have an executive city mayor and we have a local enterprise partnership we have the west of England combined authority with a regional mayor and we now have the western gateway which is our version of the where tension but who actually has the real power and the real finance to be able to take the local decisions that really leverage economic growth and can understand how we can spend what capacity we have in the best possible way and i think we really need to uh, look at that on the sectoral approach to the way in which the treasury responds i understand the difficulty in building systems and and, and trying to protect against fraud and incentivizing in the right way but evidently there are some sectoral analyses which are going to be important to us and that's linked um well the, the first one is around national security and there's questions about domestic capacity now that could be traditional stuff for example the steel industry but increasingly it may be of interest to the government to think about technology domestic capacity in the context of the kind of geopolitics technology challenge around huawei being one example in the mobile phone network in the UK the government and many conservative backbenchers by the look of it are going to be encouraging domestic capacity in the technology space um, but also 
my interest is around export capacity. Now, we know that most of our exports are services based around 70%. A lot of that's the European Union, and we'll leave that issue to one side, but of course, it's relevant to this conversation. But when we look at goods exports, one of my concerns is around um, the degree of export capacity we have that's in the periphery of, uh, of the product space, essentially. So aerospace and gas turbines and kind of automotive uh, are big chunks of our exports. Now, aerospace, I have an interest in because in North Bristol, we have Airbus, GKN, Rolls-Royce, BAE, you know, all of those guys, right? Very, very highly skilled roles, R&D intensive industry. Um, if that were to go bust or if the supply chain were to fall over, it's going to be very, very difficult to be able to make a small jump within product export space to transition them to other industries because it's so specialist um, on the outside of, of, of the product space of things that we could possibly make. And so when we think about growth opportunities, and I absolutely agree with Jürgen and the Made Smarter initiatives um, and having to invest in digital to improve productivity, but we need to understand where the easy transitions are, um, where we can jump to with the know-how and skills that we have inherently in the economy now, and how we can facilitate that transition to new potential opportunities for exports um, and growth in the future. Um, the, the, the last point I want to make um, uh, is, uh, well, two things really, it's the local and the international. Uh, the local point about our high streets I think is really important. I actually don't know the answer to these questions, so I'd be interested if anybody watching does. But, you know, as a constituency MP, uh, you know, I have these concerns at national level, but also I see the decline of the high street and the inherent impact that has on community uh, in many parts of my constituency. And where businesses have gone, a lot of third sector organizations have come in place, into place, and they can be the bedrock of community activity, whether it's about parenting or celebrating particular national events or providing the local coffee shop or whatever it might be and so if the charitable sector or the third sector isn't able to survive through this and doesn't get the right support as well as high streets not being able to get back on to um, back into business because they can't afford to take on debt liabilities that there aren't further grants or they're not helped in this transition that Lucy's been talking about then I can see very readily a very significant loss in the everyday economy, which is what my predecessor Rachel calls it. I'm sure she won't mind me using that language. Um, uh, that actually is part of the daily lived experience of many people and consumers. And we do have to try to find some answers to that. And very lastly, on the international point, you know, Bayes has responsibility for holding government to account on COP26 and thinking about our role in decarbonisation. You know, I want to see net zero decarbonisation baked into all of our fiscal and industrial strategy plans into the future. But the UK has a really important role in terms of international leadership too, because many of the smaller countries where we're going to go and say, please, can you invest in renewables, are going to be in extremely difficult economic circumstances where they've not been able to pay debt interest payments that they had before the pandemic, where they've not been able to just issue 300 billion pounds worth of guilt as we have in the UK, where they're relying on the IMF or other countries to try to keep them afloat. So to then go to them next November, COP26, and say to these smaller countries, okay, we're, we're actually bringing some of our supply chain back into the UK. Uh, we're not actually going to increase or maybe we might decrease our investment in other countries around the world. But by the way, we want you to invest in a net zero sustainable future. That doesn't add up. And we've got a responsibility as one of the richest countries in the world, albeit in very difficult circumstances and in challenge to countries like the United States, which is stepping back from some of these, to understand that there are global consequences, especially on climate, that has an impact on our economy and our economic wealth as well. And we've got an important role on the world stage to play in that space too. Thanks, Darren. That's fantastic. Um, and Darren, I know you wrote to Alex Sharma, uh, the business secretary, uh, a few days ago asking about the government's kind of uh, thinking on support uh, the rolling back of the support and the phased uh, uh, phasing of that process what's your kind of understanding on where where the government's thinking is on that have you had a have you had further interaction with them on that or not well, um, I've not had a reply to the letter yet from Alec, but I did ask the Prime Minister some of these questions yesterday. What we've been trying to do is to try to understand the kind of spectrum in which the government is comfortable interacting with the market. We don't um, I don't think we know yet what the government's appetite is or approach is to this in the recovery phase. And my argument was that actually we really need to start getting on with that. You know, we've seen the European Commission's 750 billion euro package yesterday, interestingly baking in uh, emission schemes, um, extensions to aviation and shipping. You know, Jürgen's talked about the automotive bailout in France, but the transition to electric vehicle um, uh, consumption. 
what are we doing in the UK? I don't think we actually know. We don't really know what the government's appetite is for this. And, and people are starting to ask questions. And this is important for private finance confidence, as well as confidence from workers and businesses to reopen. Um, and so my question to Alec was, for businesses that are um, unsure about whether they can make their workplaces or shops COVID-19 secure, how are we going to help them to do that? If there are disputes with workers, how do we resolve those quickly? And then my question to the Prime Minister yesterday was actually, what does this recovery plan look like? And unfortunately, um, we've not had any answers, but he did promise to bring something back before the summer recess. Uh, so uh, we look forward to seeing it. Okay, fantastic. Okay, let's go to some questions from uh, the uh, attendees. Um, uh, Thomas, Thomas Hurst has a question about um, the labour market impact. Yep, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so the question, I guess it's picking up on a theme that uh, Giles was raising uh, when he talks about sort of uh, government maintaining its involvement at the sort of macro level in terms of maintaining aggregate demand uh, and allowing the market to resolve uh, the sectoral distribution issues. Um, I wonder whether there's a tension between that and resolving the sort of lingering labour market hit from the COVID crisis given that some of the low value add sectors that have been worst impacted tend also to have some of the, uh, tend to be some of the most labor intensive sectors. I mean, in effect, is he suggesting that we've got to get comfortable at least in the medium term with significantly higher unemployment? Uh, and do we then need to look at policies to address that aspect as well? Thanks, Thomas. And uh, there's a kind of related question there, which I'd add on uh, for, for the panel, which I think is just about the politics of all this. If, you know, we have uh, sectors that are disproportionately employing lower skilled and particularly younger people who are already getting hit, well, were getting hit pretty hard uh, over the past decade anyway, uh, that seems pretty, a pretty challenging position for government policy to be in uh, if it's withdrawing support for, for, for those people. Um, I also have another question here from James Crabtree at the Lee Kuan Yew School in Singapore. James asked me to, to, to read this out because he can't uh, talk at the moment, but um, he said, uh, can, he, can, uh, can I ask what the panel thinks about A, the wisdom and B, the likelihood of success of floated government policies designed to encourage reshoring of manufacturing away from China, either to other developing markets or back to the UK? Uh, I'm not simply asking about medical supplies and devices, but more generally. Um, so, uh, question about the labour market and the politics of that, and also about the kind of supply chain, global supply chains uh, 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 perspective. Giles, do you want to go first on, on those? Yes, I mean, a really excellent question from Thomas. I'm glad he gave me 10 minutes to think about it. Um, one answer is that there might be some low skill sectors, that uh, low pay sectors that drop and some that rise. So we might move from people serving in shops to more sort of delivery and online fulfillment. One of my presumptions is that because COVID stops some of our choices, it's going to be a blow to productivity because we have less choices than before. So if productivity is falling, as a result of this, because we're forced to choose second best ways of doing lots of things that we wouldn't otherwise choose. We shouldn't necessarily expect employment necessarily to be down at the end. But as one of the people who's made the case for industrial strategy for 10 years, I want to make clear, I think there's a lot we should be doing to intervene right now, including copying the Scandinavian approach towards reskilling people towards new jobs, that we're spending a huge amount, as um, Baroness Neville-Jones made clear earlier, a huge amount um, on um, on, uh, on, on the CJRS and keeping people not doing things. If we took just a portion of that money and reskill people, uh, we, will, um, we will be able to do an awful lot in terms of making people right for the next set of jobs. On, on the second one, just uh, on the reshoring supply chains, I thoroughly agree that there's lots of problems with this. That the moment you start doing things like the really aggressive action we've seen in the States against certain Chinese interests, you just distort markets, you force activity to go in other places. It's like trying to cage smoke. It's extremely difficult to just bring everything in. I mean, I remember the Labour government discussed this in the 70s when they thought they were going to face some kind of a siege, a siege economy situation post the IMF crisis. Even they thought this was going to be really, really difficult. So I, I don't see the case for it at all. We benefit by being part of a big global economy. We're a very small part of it and we need to benefit from access to all of that capital. I, I just don't think it's a good idea. Uh, Jürgen, do you want to take that up next? Yeah, well, again, taking both of those questions. Um, I mean, on the first one of the 
um, you know, the industries with, with lower skilled, lower paid jobs. Um, I do think it's inevitable that we're going to see a, a rise in unemployment in the short term. Um, I do think that will happen. Um, so there will have to be some thinking about stimulus measures you can do to sort of quickly take on that labour. And I think there are some good ideas. I mean, the, the Labour Party have launched an idea of the, uh, the sort of the Green Army. Um, I'm not sure it's thought through well enough yet. Um, but, uh, but, but, I, but I do think, you know, you could put a stimulus in the marketplace. It's been done before. So we have some mechanisms for saying, you know, we're going to put schemes in for insulating homes, uh, for putting in better control systems, for uh, solar schemes and all that sort of thing. And then you could do, you know, quite a quick, because those are not, you know, they're, they're skilled, but they're not, you know, you don't need to be a, a computer scientist or anything. So you could begin to reskill people into then going out and supplying that demand that is being generated uh, for those sorts of things, either in the domestic or the industrial um, uh, market. So, so that's one sort of policy area we can think about, about how to sort that short-term unemployment. Um, on, the, um, on the sort of the, 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 the supply chains and the manufacturing, I, I'm with Giles on this one. It's incredibly difficult uh, to distort the market, as you put it, um, and, and I go back to my point, which is the best way you can do it, is to have an industrial strategy to create focus, to create local um, R&D ecosystems like we've done around offshore wind. And we do that around other sectors. And in that way, you encourage supply chains to come locally because that's where they want to be. And that's where they can be because it's uh, what well, is cost effective. The final point I would say on that is, I mean, what all of the China uh, and the trade war with the U USA and the China is showing us is you know, how ludicrous the discussion is that uh, we are going to be the new global trader and all of that new global trade is going to absorb any downside we see from uh, having a, uh, a less attractive uh, trading arrangement with the EU. Um, and uh, look, I'm not making a Brexit point here in terms of I think it's all wrong. We're, we, we're Brexiting and we need to get on with it. Uh, but the notion that we're going to suddenly be trading with China um, and have all of this upside is ridiculous. And I think we urgently need to extend um, the negotiation. We need to calm down and we need to work out how we're going to get the right trading relationship because our closer supply chains and our more secure supply chains for markets like the one you were talking about, Darren, uh, that you uh, enjoy in Bristol around aerospace, it's always going to be in Europe. So we need to secure that. Mm -hmm. Great. Lucy, back to you. Um, yeah, a couple of, of thoughts. First, on the first, I mean, I agree that doing something on skills is the answer to helping with this huge unemployment problem that we're going to have for a while. Um, I did some work last year for the party on what businessmen cared about in terms of what could make a big difference. And they all said that having digital skills alongside reading and maths could actually make a big difference so that people were more you know, the, the new world, whether it's green or AI or whatever, we do need to upskill. So I think this could actually be quite a good, good moment of opportunity to do some of that. So, I mean, I agree that sk skills are very important. I mean, on sourcing, um, I perhaps take a slightly different view from my own experience at Tesco, where we obviously sourced in 93 countries and also obviously had services, services outsourced into India, call centers and so on. What I think we found was that increasingly you needed diversification of where your stuff came from. So we were moving out of China into Bangladesh and in, even into Africa with the things that we were buying. Um, and I think that in a world where you can get pandemics and wars and difficulties actually underlines the need for that. There's also some sign that uh, with partly with climate aspirations, some of the supply chains have been shortening a bit. So clothing coming from Turkey and North Africa, you know, not just from Southeast Asia. But I'd like to pick up a point somebody made, it was probably Darren, about the importance of helping the um, sort of underdeveloped countries. Uh, we had to take a decision on whether we should continue to source from Bangladesh when they had a couple of issues with child labor. And we actually stuck with Bangladesh 
we kind of did training for the factories rather than moving out of Bangladesh as some of our competitors did because of the importance that the sourcing actually um, provided for, for our own, for, for those, eco those emerging economies. So to some extent, you do need to buy from around the world. And also, obviously there's an economic reason for, for doing that. I'm a free trader as well. Okay, great. Uh, Darren, do you want to follow up on this? Sure, just a couple of final points. I mean, on the on the labour market question, uh, the, the, the thing that sits in my mind the most is that surely it must be more productive for us as a country to reskill workers when they are in a role, not when they are at, at home on universal mm -hmm. credits. Um, and so the question for me is, how do you ensure that happens? And where does it happen? Uh, and that might mean, for example, that uh, business continues to work uh, with government uh, around uh, cash flow support for uh, um, apprenticeships, especially. Uh, and Jürgen's talked about some great examples around energy efficiency, which the government intends to fund and heat networks and heat pumps and all that stuff. But also just more generally on a, on a, on a cross-sectoral basis, how do you keep somebody in a gainful sense of employment, whether that's in the private sector or helping in the National Health Service or social care or the councils, or whether it's actually being placed inside third sector groups that we know we need in order to help rebuild our economies and link that with the opportunity opportunities around skills and learning development now, there's a question about how you deliver that skills and learning so that it is the best quality that it's the right skills and learning and that you're making sure you're getting bang for your buck but the kind of starting point for me is it's much easier to do that when they're in a position somewhere where it can be delivered as opposed to at home on universal credit and that's the key thing on my mind around that question on supply chains I won't add much more other than saying that um, I was surprised to learn, I kind of assumed the UK was in the same category as say Japan, South Korea and Switzerland in terms of our economic complexity and that we didn't really have much room to go in terms of providing new opportunities for export growth because we were already very technologically advanced on the frontier. Now we are in certain industries in the frontier where we're in that kind of new ideas innovation space and that's why the R&D budget is so important. But actually we're really not that economically complex compared to the countries. We do well compared to other countries but there's room for growth um, in the normal opportunities for expansion of goods um, manufacturing and export. And so the, the issues I raised in the second reading of the trade bill last week was about British manufacturing which I think has a huge opportunity around the leveling up agenda in other parts of the country where actually we have the skills and capacity to start to make some stuff that we've not made for a long time which still maintains that balance between supporting and having the benefit of international supply chains but also stimulating growth and opportunities in the UK. And I was amazed that the only only two new goods uh, that we've added to our export basket um, in the last 10 years uh, was one leather products fine uh, and second it was um, goat bovine and pig fats um, which you know great for those industries but they're very very small markets whereas some of the electronics manufacturing where we have perfect capacity to be able to expand production in the UK and export potential with huge market potential globally we're just not really doing and so in any new industrial strategy conversation that's linked to supply chains I think we need to get that balance right that we've talked about today but pick some of the things where we know uh, we can stimulate growth and opportunities for the country in the future too. Okay, uh, great. Thanks, Darren. Now, I've got uh, a few questions. We're only going to have time for one more round, um, but I have a couple of questions where people can't uh, speak, so I'll read them out. Uh, one is around what does the panel think about attaching conditions to bailouts and support, like we're seeing Macron do in France with the bailout of Air France uh, and um, uh, 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 and saying that they can't compete with sh short haul, uh, with, with uh, you know, high-speed rail. Um, so one question there about, about linking it to broader goals like the green agenda. Um, a second question uh, from Steve Coulter. Steve, if I can unmute you about short termism um, to ask your question. Yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. A very interesting discussion. Um, so we saw in the aftermath of the financial crisis and the recession and then the recovery, uh, very low productivity, extremely low productivity, firms not really um, investing enough, a lot of discussion of um, sort of short termism, uh, so firms just not sort of um, really having long term strategies and failing to invest, which gave rise to the sort of, you know, discussions of stakeholder capitalism and the purposeful companies. Um, is there a danger that we're going to see this as we recover from COVID that we're going to need businesses to be really, really dynamic, um, but they're, they're going to be cash strapped? 
they're going to be uncertain about the future and so we may have a recurrence of the short-termism problem and if so is that maybe then a very good argument for a kind of targeted industrial strategy okay great and just finally a kind of broader question to end on from alistair mcneil who's unable to uh, ask directly but he says um uh, on Darren's point about the current flawed devolution model, does the panel expect or want a more de decentralised UK following the crisis? Uh, and what are the key differences to encourage or uh, avoid? So we've got something there on bailout conditions, short termism, and the kind of devolution model, which is a bit of a broader uh, question. So maybe if I go in the same order as we've been doing, Giles, I'll come to you first. And any final comments? If you could keep your response to a minute, that would be fantastic. Okay, I'll time myself to a minute. Um, on devolution, the logic is absolutely impeccable. The logic has been impeccable for 10, 20 years. The politics is always awful. And I think the assertive, and in my view, strong um, uh, performance of the Labour mayors in the, in the last um, few weeks makes it more difficult. You're going to give power and prominence to people who are your enemies. And that was the problem that the Theresa May government had to do. But I totally agree that devolution ought to be a key part of, of fixing all of all on fixing all of this kind of stuff. Um, in terms of, um, so, sorry, in terms of the long-termism one, one thing that strikes me, particularly listening to um, um, Lucy and, and others talking about um, the way large businesses have behaved, on the whole, large businesses are pretty long-term. They realise that their future is tied up on doing things really well. Government can be incredibly short-term. And so the idea that government can at least lecture business on how to become more long-term, I agree that there's going to be a problem with uh, preferences for cash and protection over long-term investments. We've all been given a massive lesson in how valuable it is being liquid and having a lot of cash resource when something like this might go wrong. But that's that's like logical short-termism or, or keeping cash there. It's not necessarily, uh, so yeah, we might need to do something about boosting investment, but I don't really join in and pe on this assault on the corporate sector for not being long-term enough. I think on the whole, they tend to have longer business plans than governments stick to their manifestos okay great uh jürgen to you yeah well short termism and long termism i actually just did a blog on that so if anybody's interested have a look at my linkedin uh, profile and uh, and i mean it's 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 a it's a, it's almost a sort of a disease we have in the uk um and uh, and it's partially driven out of our sort of financial markets um, it's partially driven out of mindset of business themselves, which sometimes just doesn't think as long term as the company that I was lucky to work for for 30 years, a German parented company, uh, and those you see in Japanese companies. Um, and it's also because we have a terrible cross-party approach to things you know so we we just lurch from sort of you know and it's not just you know even when you change ministers within one party i mean i've been uh, helping drive advanced manufacturing as an industrial strategy for 10 years and the amount of ministers and secretaries of states and people in the treasury uh, in number 10 one of them being giles i also work with lucy on some of this and the amount of people you have to persuade of the same arguments time and time again go around the same houses often reinvent the same wheels is really quite frustrating so you know we do need to somehow and i really don't have the answer to that question but there needs to be a you know a better long-term approach i actually think darren your select committee ought to have a lot more power because that's probably one of the places where you can create that sort of cross-party long-term approach and the other area where i agree which is the second question which is and you need to make sure you build the uh, devolved uh, authorities in the local uh, uh, regions that can then deliver on these things and there needs to be trust um, to do that and actually I just listened yesterday to a speech by Angela Merkel in German um, and and her whole speech was about her absolute trust of her 16 devolved nations and of course many of those are a different color to her own politics but it was her trust in them being able to deliver both you know what's being done on covid but then this sort of economic uh, recovery and the way the 16 nations have kept together on this but still being able to deliver locally has really been quite remarkable and you compare that to you know i mean we're fragmenting all over the place both on managing the covid and now on this discussion of how we pull out of it, and we just need to sort out our politics um, in, in that both cross-party and that devolution agenda. Okay, thanks. And Lucy? 
I mean, I was going to mention Germany in relation to de decentralization because I think they do that well. Um, clearly, it's important you get the division of responsibilities and duties very clear. I think clarity and then let the devolves, whether it's um, Andy Street or the Scots, get on with it. Um, they bring a lot of skills, you know, um, people like that. The council leader in Leeds, who's been helping with the testing, Trace and Track, I think he's actually the main reason it's, it's come on so much. Short termism, I mean, in business, short termism is often to do with being in a lot of financial difficulty. And sometimes you can't think long term because you've got to think about your future. Maybe you need to go out of business, but that's difficult. I found successful businesses think, think long term and do that well and better than governments. In government, there are too many changes. My greatest success was to stay as IP minister for nearly three years, um, but that's very unusual. Um, and then on bailout conditions, which nobody's mentioned, um, I mean, not too many, please. Uh, I think too much of this is a big mistake that you need to keep it narrow and financial and get people back, you know, trading and growing. Maybe dividends, but then, you know, what do you do for the shareholders if you can't play any dividends to companies then the pension funds are going to be in trouble i think that's probably the subject for another for another seminar thank you it is uh, and darren finally to you i'll be very brief because i'm conscious of time i mean on bailout conditions um I, I don't mind them in principle but they need to be pragmatic and deliverable and they need to be linked to actually knowing what you want to deliver in an industrial strategy uh, whether that's about climate or corporate culture or whatever it might be so until we understand what we're trying to achieve i'm not sure how we can attach conditions to achieve it so you kind of got to get it in the right the right order and on devolution you will have guessed my view on this issue uh, i think we do need a more devolved um uh, governance structure in our country but it needs to be effective with the right capacity and the right freedom to be able to deliver for the whole country not just the particular regions that are given particular models um, and I think we need a whole review of that in order to be able to get that right for the future. Okay great we, we are uh, pretty much out of time it's been a fascinating discussion and as we feel our way through the next few months and things become a bit clearer I'm sure minds will change. You, I, I sort of sense in the panel a kind of uh, a division between the some more in, less interventionist stance of Lucy and Giles and perhaps slightly more interventionist stance of Jürgen and, and Darren and maybe we'll get you all back again in a few months time to see whether anybody's uh, changed their mind uh, but it's been a fantastic discussion thank you all so much for your time thank you everyone for joining uh, online and on the live stream and do join us again uh, uh, for future uh, sessions in the meantime uh, have a good day thank you <laughs>